I, I'm probably more accurately described as an anti-anti-spam guy, uh, and the reasons for that will become clear uh, during the discussion. I, I found this uh, actually last week, and it kind of gets the idea across. Uh, it does overstate the numbers, but not by as much as you might imagine. Uh, rough estimate worldwide, about 2 million legitimate email messages a day get eaten by spam filters. It is a staggering statistic. Granted, there's a lot more email that flowing in the world, but the anti-spam systems are doing a lot of harm to people for whom email is critical. Fortunately, it's not critical for everyone. Uh, I am Raz, or at work, I'm Roland Turner. I'm the product manager for Real Mail, uh, which is Box Entry's flagship product. Box Entry is an early stage company in Singapore, which is a fascinating place to start a business, and I strongly recommend it. In fact, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, I am not here today to do anything to be corporate, as perhaps you can tell from my attire. So this is the last slide from the, the corporate template that you'll see. Uh, prior to meeting uh, Box Entry CEO, I had never installed an anti-spam filter. I've lived on four continents. I have friends in large numbers all over the world and depend on email. And the idea that uh, a piece of software might randomly decide to throw away a piece of, of a contact from a friend disturbed me so much that even as that two years ago, I had never installed a piece of anti-spam software. Uh, I met with, in fact, a friend of a friend who's the CEO uh, of Box Entry, and quickly, it was a meeting of minds, so I thought, I'll, I'll get on board. The, what I'll talk about today is not mostly the problem. Uh, when I was accepted to, uh, uh, to speak at the mini-conf, I received there was a, a polite note pointing out that I should be talking about the problem and the uh, solutions available in the open source community. I will talk only briefly at the end about what Box Entry is making available to the open source community. Uh, a quick show of hands, and, and to perhaps a precursor to your uh, boff session. How many people in the room are mail server admins, either for themselves or for an organization? And can I now ask you lower hands if, you have, if you're an admin for less than 10 other users? Those who are admins for 10 or more other users, who are you? Oh, fair number, good. Um, I guess while I'm at it, I'll ask uh, if those who are using particularly open source software, uh, how many of those are using Spam Assassin with you in either group of admins? Right, pretty well everyone. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, so, so I have reworked my presentation completely for today, and consequently, I'm depending on notes. Uh, this is not the corporate presentation I've given two or three hundred times. Um, there's a whole lot of problems with spam, but here's one of them. So, and again, this sort of tickled my fancy, but uh, it also points to part of why there's a problem with anti-spam. If the problem is we're wasting all this time deleting email, or if that's part of the problem, the solution is obvious. Let's automate the deletion of the spam. And, and broadly, there are two approaches to this problem, neither of which is flawless. The first, hopefully, all those who have raised their hands earlier recognize the term, but for the benefit of those who don't. The real-time block lists are at their DNS accessed service, and they provide a way for you to ask uh, for a given IP address, uh, does a given RBL operator think something bad about this IP address? The premise is, or the, the underlying idea is, if the answer is yes, then that IP address has been observed sending some amount of spam, hopefully sometime recently. Uh, there's some problems with this. Uh, the most serious is that it may also be sending legitimate email. Uh, there's at least two reasons for that, two common reasons. One is that mail servers are shared. So if you're sending email from your corporate mail environment, uh, or even if not, if it's personal, in almost all cases, your MUA or email client is forwarding the message to a mail server somewhere, which in turn is delivering the message to the, the listed mail exchanger for the destination domain. Uh, maybe you haven't got a problem, but your colleague has an infected PC that's currently part of a botnet and is delivering outbound spam. The fact that your mail server is being the vector for that doesn't mean that your mail is spam. Or if your mail server has been attacked by a, a piece of malware and it's now being used as an open relay. Secondly, even if the mail server isn't the issue, certainly for small offices who are using <laughs> sharing one IP address for a small office mail server plus all the browsing environment for their PCs, the IP address itself is shared. So for at least these two reasons and a number of others, uh, even if you're dealing with an IP address that really has been sending spam in the last 10 seconds, you still have a problem, assuming that therefore any mail coming from it is spam. Uh, unfortunately, it gets even worse. 
The first is that frequently RBL entries are entire slash 24 blocks, even if only 10 or 20 of the addresses within the block have been seen as spam sources. Uh, this is guilt by association or bad neighbourhoods. If it happens that your hosting provider is either uh, not very diligent or if some of their customers have allowed their machines to become compromised, suddenly your ability to send email is compromised. The situation gets even worse for the 50 odd percent of email admins, uh, most of whom aren't in this room, uh, for whom English is a second language and or have limited contact with the major receivers and the major ISPs in the US and in Europe. The latter are all members of a group called the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group, as am I. Um, this group meets a couple of times a year and thrashes out standards for dealing with uh, both blocking abuse and facilitating legitimate use. All these guys have each other on speed dial. If I'm the, you know, an o operator of an outbound mail relay at AOL and I get onto uh, a spam house block list, uh, I'm on the phone to Larry immediately. And the, the problem gets solved fast. The RBL process and system depends upon the fact that the, uh, when errors do occur, the people who are affected are able to get them quick fixed quickly. Uh, dealing with one of the ISPs in Singapore, and there are only three, but so, you know, one of the major, but one of the ISPs in Singapore, they have adopted, and in Singapore they speak English, or a, a close, what's called a Creole of English. This gets worse if you step into Taiwan or you know, anywhere else in the Asia Pac region that isn't Australia or New Zealand. One of those ISPs runs their ISP cluster on a set of IP addresses and has three additional sets of IP addresses standing by. If they have the misfortune to get themselves onto a major RBO, without us, before they do anything else, they move their mail servers onto another set of IP addresses. This is known as shape shifting. It's the behavior of spammers. Hmm? Snowshoeing is, is a term I've heard, it depends which, which community and, and where, but the, there are different terms. But in essence, they're doing what spammers do in order to stop getting into having problems with, being, uh, with sending from machines they've compromised. But they're legitimate ISPs. Their problem is they don't know personally the operators of the major IBLs. So it's what, sound, what seems like a good idea, the list of IP addresses that are sending spam, turns out to have some rather complicated operational and human problems tacked on the back end of it, and they are particularly acute uh, where English isn't the first or primary language. Th this is not to say that they're useless, just that they don't do quite what it says on the tin. The other major approach is content filtering. And uh, without getting into it, the roughly dictionaries of rude words, bad words, uh, strings of characters or, or words that are being spotted in spam, some of them are updated very quickly. But the bottom line is, if you work in medicine, pharmaceuticals or finance, you're going to have actual trouble doing your legitimate business. If you're a bank sending periodic uh, notices to your customers about their mortgages, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, reduced uh, deliverability is the, is the term of art. And likewise for a whole range of medical practices, if you're talking about drugs or talking about body parts, and a whole range of pharmaceuticals, any high value drug, almost any high value drug in the world, and certainly any that's uh, c prescription controlled, is being offered by spammers somewhere. So there's you know, a list of high value pharmaceuticals, look in your uh, content filter dictionary. Uh, the other one is, is honestly more funny than, than a problem, unless you happen to be in a country where this matters. Yeah, <laughs> watch the, the tricky seats up the back there. Um, there are, in a number of languages other than English, uh, words that are uh, problematic in English. Uh, my favorite example is a common suffix on Thai names is pawn. Uh, we work because we're in Singapore with a number of people in the region and, and our new list of contacts in Thailand includes Ataporn and Juriporn. Juriporn has cut the end of her name which doesn't make sense to a Thai speaker, simply so she can reliably send email to her customers. That's broken. Any way you cut it, that's broken. For the most part, the content filters give you a good first approximation, but where they get it wrong, they get it really wrong. So, where was I? Again, apologies, I've re re recut the whole thing. Um, all of this leads to, I'll get to how we deal with this, but all this leads to, uh, well, ridiculous conversations like this one. Nope. Nope. Oh dear. I'm on the wrong slide. All right. I will now ad lib. The, the, the solution that's proposed and the most widely used one, and that's why I asked the question about Spam Assassin, is to use Bayesian 
techniques to uh, perform a large number of tests, typically hundreds, uh, weight the results, add them together, and then you, you, know, you make a decision. And hopefully, if it's come from somewhere that's been recently listed as being a spam source and also contains some bad words, therefore you can safely block it. Uh, it sounds like magic. It looks very complicated if you go through the numbers. But the problem remains. There's still a rate of error. And uh, as, as so often in life, the errors tend to correlate in ways that you wouldn't expect. So despite the process of uh, going through the Bayesian self-learning thing and, and optimizing it, you're making it sort of least bad rather than correct. So you still have actual mail loss occurring. And at rates that are, for those for whom email is critical, and that's a limited set of email users, uh, high. Uh, typical rates are about one in a thousand legitimate email messages or one in a hundred thousand email messages, given that most are spam. So, uh, and I've now really have messed up my sequence. Sorry about this. The reason this comes about is that in principle, what the Bayesian system says it does is, okay, let's take our various tests. The RBL lookups and content tests are the common ones. Increasingly, authentication and reputation are entering the picture. More about that later. And something else called traffic analysis, which I'll just skip for today. It's a good idea. It's not magic, but it, it's helpful. But it will take a lot more, too much time to explain than I would like to spend today. Uh, do some sort of processing and split your messages into three buckets. The stuff we know is spam, so we can refuse it. Worse, we're so certain it's spam, we can accept it and then throw it away. Unbelievably bad idea. Uh, a bunch of messages that we are certain are good and we'll deliver to the inbox. And a set in between where we're not sure and we'll quarantine them or put them in a spam tray or something similar. The reality is that we're actually not sure about all three buckets. It actually looks more like this. You've taken the score and you've applied a distribution. Now, hopefully, if you are good at your, if your Bayesian training thing is working really well, this line here is really flat. And these bits here are very steep and very close to the edges. But there is no uh, RBL or content basis in the world today that has a straight line up here, a straight line across here, and a straight line up here. They, they don't exist, and in principle, they can't exist. So, where does that leave us? Oh, the, oh, here he is. The absurd conversations that result. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've had this one from time to time, and not just with my mum. Uh, we have seen it with customers repeatedly, particularly in sales contexts, uh, people who are doing large, uh, complicated bids where they've got participants in half a dozen countries. Uh, they're critically dependent upon email, and they have extremely tight deadlines. If they miss uh, a deadline in, in a sales process, they miss an opportunity to get a bid into for a committee or something. So we're talking tens of millions of dollars here. Then you know, a lot of people get unhappy fast. So it's, this is the, the fun way to talk about it, but commercially and in support contexts, and in some cases in safety critical, critical contexts, it's a whole lot more serious than you missed your mother's invitation to dinner. So it's not completely hopeless. There's, there's room for improvement. We can't get it right. In reality, even with what I'm talking about today, we still end up with this curve. Um, what I'll talk about today will shrink that bit up the top right, the false positives, the bits where the, the spam filter says it's spam, when in reality it isn't. The observation is this. The RBL lookups, the content tests, and to a less extent, traffic analysis, are all statistical. An RBL, a negative listing, if you've got an email message coming from an IP address that's listed on RBL, that tells you nothing, nothing at all, about whether that message is spam. It tells you that some number of the messages from a given IP address were spam. And for RBLs which give you a, a ranking, it tells you what fraction of the messages from that IP address is a spam, but nothing about whether this message is spam. And the same is true for the content filters, content tests. It tells you that 90% of the, word of the uh, emails with the names of, of genitals in them are spam, but nothing about whether this message is. Uh, authentication does not have this characteristic. And, and authentication and the uh, implied positive reputation data, which I will talk about in a moment. Either the message does come from someone that we want to hear from, or a legitimate sender, or don't know. Sadly, it can't give you a definite yes or a definite no, but it's either we are certain this message comes from someone you ought to hear from, or we know nothing. There's no curve. It's a, it's a hard edge. We either got a, we are, it's back what the, the, the idealized diagram of the anti-spam systems. If it's in the green bucket, it's all good. Give or take malware. Don't skip malware checking, but certainly for spam. So the authentication question. Uh, I want to talk a bit about what that is and, and how it works. 
lest it is not obvious, this is not my mother. Let us assume that the person who is sending is actually offering a, a somewhat less absurd claim. We have a message that purports to be from someone at example.com. So the first part of this authentication and reputation question is, is the message from the person who it's supposed to be from? Broadly speaking, there are two widely deployed ways for the controller of a domain to indicate to the public, or to help the public, to help receivers work out whether messages are legitimate. The first is SPF, written by, in fact, one of my colleagues in Singapore, Meng Wong, and its cousin, Sender ID. This is spectacularly simple. Uh, stick that in your DNS, and you're basically saying that your, if your MX is also your app and relay, um, any email message purporting to be from your domain that is presented from the IP address of your mail server can be assumed to be authentic. I'm hearing some mumbling. Is there a question? There's an issue with, well, Internode won't use it. There are other uh, issues with different server providers making different use of this data. Uh, one of the problems was an early naive assumption that this could be used to block bad mail. Uh, I don't want to get into a SPF tutorial today, but just briefly, that tilde all at the end of the string is a policy that says if, if you are using an IP address that isn't my A, my a record or my MX record, then I don't know. So I'm only making a positive assertion here. If you've got a message that from, in this case, example.com, that purport, that comes from, that is being presented from an IP address that's either my A record or my MX record, then I'm saying, yes, this is from me. Otherwise, I'm saying, I don't know. There are people deploying uh, SPF records that say minus all on the end. The problem with that is, if a message gets forwarded, the, uh, the IP address that it's coming from is no longer the IP address of the mail server controlled by example.com. So it's a, a very limited tool. It's very cheap to implement. On the, on the sender side, this is all, of it is all it is, and on the receiver side, it's only slightly more complicated. Oh, thank you. I beg your pardon. There is a, a single use for minus all. If you have a, a domain that never sends email, then you just have take out the A and the MX and put minus all in the end. It's a way of publicly saying this domain never sends email. Uh, a useful corner case. So what about forwarding? Uh, you know, step up in implementation complexity several steps to something called DKIM. Uh, this is basically public key cryptography applied to the problem. Uh, as with PGP or SMIME or any of those, uh, generate a private key, keep it secret. Uh, construct the corresponding public key and publish it, in this case through the DNS rather than through a, a key server. And then each message that goes out gets a header, gets a signature. In this case, it's a DKIM signature header is added to the message because the requirements for DKIM were invisible to end users. So unlike PGP, which puts the ASCII armoring in the, the message body, this happens entirely in the header. And it indicates which bits of the message are being signed and then applies the, the signature. This is great. So now you've, you, I can sign a message and it can be forwarded as many times as, as necessary and before it reaches you. And you can still look at it and say, yes, this really came from RADS. That's great, except that spammers publish DNS records too. In fact, most spammers publish more DNS records than all the people in this room combined. So uh, there was a very short period of time, uh, months perhaps, when publishing SPF was a quick way of separating yourself from spammers. But then pretty promptly spammers realized that those who were deploying SPF at the receiver side were biasing it positively and pretty quickly. It's, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's reversed since, but there was, there was a period of time for which uh, if you saw an SPF record, there was a good chance it was a spammer. Sorry, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, so in, initially the idea came out, early adopters put it together, and then spammers noticed that receivers were biasing in favor of it. So suddenly, spammers were more likely to publish SPF records than SPF and DKIM than legitimate senders. Uh, largely through the efforts of Morg, uh, or the participants in Morg, not Morg itself, that, that game has changed. Um, now the majority of the world's email is sent from a source that provides either DKIM signing or SPF. Uh, it's a small majority, but it is a majority. If, if you actually do the stats, you'll find between 50 and 60% of your mail typically. Uh, most of that is due to the major web mail providers deciding to adopt either or both of these standards. But yes, the problem remains. All this does is authenticate that the message comes from someone who, is in con who has control of the domain from which it came. Uh, but that doesn't tell you much if they actually admit they're from a domain that isn't you know, 
uh, westpac.com. So um, the problem, the next part of the problem is what is known as reputation. Having authenticated a sender, the question we now want to answer is, is it actually worth accepting a message from this person? Uh, I don't want to get into the, the full history of positive reputation data, but probably the standout example of this at the moment is the Havia Safe List, which is uh, in use unknowingly perhaps to all of you who raised your hand when you said you use Spam Assassin. Uh, it is, if I call it correctly, it's turned on by default. If Habeas has audited and certified an organization, they're paying the subscription, the IP address that that organization uses for originating its mail appears in the Habeas safe list and Spam Assassin will rate it as a minus eight. It's a very narrow and specific thing. It only deals with source IP addresses and only for those who are willing to go through the audit and subscription process. So that's generally speaking only legitimate mass mail marketers. And that's what Habeas is checking, that you're not a spammer. That if you, if someone has gone through this process, they've provided evidence that they are only sending email to people who have confirmed opt-in, that have functioning opt-out, don't buy lists, don't sell lists, all that other good stuff. At this point, I forget where I was going to go next. Uh, I really forget what's going to go next. So, oh yes, there was another. There were two problems with an approach like Habeas's, despite the fact that it's widely deployed. And there's similar work that being done by Return Path, who recently acquired Habeas. The first is that they focus almost entirely on the the origin IP address, which means the forwarding problem comes back into play. The second is that they are global, and that uh, it's, a, it's a long tail problem. I, I don't know how many people will recognize the term long tail, but the global data that's published necessarily only deals with uh, the large amount of email that comes from a small number of, a small number of servers. It's, it's in the tens of thousands maximum. Uh, there's a huge volume of email that comes out of smaller servers, servers in countries where English isn't spoken, servers run by individuals or small organizations, which is legitimate, which people depend upon for doing business, but which Habeas can't make money, or now return path, uh, selling, auditing, and subscription for because there isn't enough money involved, and return paths. I forget the name of the product. Sorry, uh, but it's a statistical rating of the legitimacy of mail coming out of very high volume correspondent servers. Typically, again, web mail providers, but certainly email service providers generally. Both of these sources can only deal with very high volume uh, mail servers. They can't deal with the mail servers that deal with the other sort of 30, 40% of the world's email. The What's missing is decisions that are being made of the same type, deciding, hey, this is a good guy, we should skip the spam filter. But for an individual mail service or organization's correspondence, rather than for a global reputation service. This is the, sort of the point where, in a commercial context, I'm like, OK, and here's what real mail offers, that um, our, our commercial offering learns how your users tend to, cores tend to communicate, whom they correspond with, whom they accept mail from, and fairly quickly, usually within weeks, is able to authenticate most of the mail that's being authenticated and uh, I think the right word, determine that it's worth receiving, accepting the mail from most of the people you talk to most of the time. This takes that sort of green chunk at the right, the false positive section of that graph, and shaves about 90%, mm, between 90 and 99%, depending on the organization and the situation. So it, if you have a false positive rate beforehand of 0.1%, which are typical, you will insert another one or two zeros uh, after the decimal point. So it's, it doesn't make spam go away, but what it does do is reduce the harm done by a purely Bayesian or purely blocking approach to the problem. So I've been working with Box Entry for a couple of years and was uh, you know, having a chat with my uh, CEO over a drink. Uh, Box Entry, a company I work with in, in Singapore. Uh, the, there are links on about two slides down. Um, and what I was looking at was, well, I'd really like to make this available to uh, quote, the open source community, unquote. Well, am I running out of time? That's good, because I only have one more slide. Maybe, maybe two. Um, what can we do? What can we make available? So, uh, unfortunately, I, I can't at this point open our source. 
Uh, nor can I open that data. What I can do, and what I'm in fact announcing right now, is making available the ability to query the data. So in order to do that, we've recast part of Real Mail as a hosted application called Rex. Uh, it has access to all of our global data, plus the learning component of Real Mail uh, applied in a hosted application rather than on your mail server. So it's two pieces, the hosted app, and then a, at the moment a spam assassin plugin called Rex Tools. The two things, the access to the global data to the extent that we have it, and that's largely come from uh, deals we have with our various service provider customers, plus the self-learning from your the uh, correspondence behavior of your own users. Uh, so that my CEO could see I hadn't completely lost my mind, the deal is it's, it's a low query rate, uh, although I welcome commercial inquiries. But the, the aim of this presentation and this piece of code is for those who are running uh, less than 100,000 messages in total. Uh, it's probably somewhere in the 20 to 100 user uh, range. 100,000 queries in a 24 hour period. So, hmm? about one a second, but bear in mind that includes the spam. All right, so that, that's what, we're, what we have on offer. Uh, unfortunately, my schedule for the last eight weeks has been unbelievable and the code didn't get, or rather the client side part of the code didn't get written. Uh, the repackaging of Real Mail's reputation piece did get done, and it's now available as a hosted app. But the client piece is currently uh, remnants on the, the, the basis piece of code sitting on my notebook. I aim to upload it in the next couple of days. So uh, useful links. If nothing else, note the first one, because it contains a PDF of this presentation. Uh, the source code will land on SourceForge, I hope within days. Uh, the two mailing lists do exist. And, and if nothing else, if what I'm doing does interest you, please just subscribe to the announced list. But of course. Uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's me. And, and the, the, the final plug, uh, we are hiring. Uh, if this is something that interests you, and in particular if you have uh, a background as a software developer, um, sadly Perl is our tool of choice, at which I'm no expert, um, Sadly for me, <laughs> I'm finding writing a spam assassin plugin difficult. It's only two pages of code, but I don't know the language. Um, and or uh, sort of operation of large infrastructures or managed services. Uh, and particularly if you're interested in working in Singapore, in the tropics, uh, please talk to me. Uh, do we have time for a question or do we, uh, <coughs> how tight are we? I ran 30 minutes. I've carefully, I've carefully not talked about uh, Box Entry's commercial offerings because that was kind of out of scope for today. Uh, our product is Real Mail. It's a perimeter email security system that does a whole range of things, but included in that, the key piece is this learning a reputation, a local reputation database by observing the communication behavior of users, and that's the sort of the piece to enhance the use of global data that's necessarily less specific. Uh, I can talk to you much more about what we do if you're interested offline. Others? Stunned silence. Oh, yeah. You don't need to be on constant terms with the NSPA operators. Most of the good ones respond within 24 hours. That's not fast. 24 hours is nowhere near fast enough if you're running an outbound relay. You need to be able to get off a list in 15 minutes. If you're AOL, Google, Ma Microsoft, or Yahoo, you can. And if you're a major carrier in, in yeah, much, the experience that particularly the telco I dealt with, was talking about in Singapore and several others in the region is they can't. It takes days, sometimes weeks. Or, or never, yeah. So it's. I, I, yeah, I don't, I, but you're, you're, you're kind of making my argument for me. The bottom line is, if you have a million users, being on an RBL is a catastrophe. If you can't get off in minutes, and there we have talked, I've talked personally to the guys who run the mail servers for the many of these ISPs, they cannot get off in minutes. Frequently they can't get off in weeks because they won't get responses, the right people won't make themselves available. They have a commercial problem, and so they adopt uh, some rather roundabout approaches. So it's a, hopefully, 
continuing to improve, and I, I'm sorry I won't name names because we have we do business with people on both sides of this equation, but uh, the situation is nowhere near mm, professional. This is a very difficult problem to solve uh, for some ISPs, some more than others.